Hello, and thanks for joining us for How to Think Like a Reviewer. Today's training is brought to you by the Adirondack Rural Health Network, and it's as a way to help build your grant-seeking capacity. I'm your trainer for this session, Diane Leonard. I'm a GPC, which means I'm a Grant Professional Certified. That's through the Grant Professional Certification Institute, an affiliate organization of the Grant Professionals Association. I'm also one of about 40 approved trainers for the Grant Professionals Association. Now, I wish that either of those things guaranteed that we received all the grant funding, <laughs> but nope, there's no such thing. There is no guarantee when it comes to grant funding, grant applications, and you probably already know that as you're coming to today's trainer training, I should say. Well, my background is actually as a grant maker, so that's where I started my career, but I've been on the grant seeking side with you right there in the trenches for more than 15 years. And in that time, what I'm going to share with you today is helped secure more than $92 million in competitive awards for foundations and state grants and federal grants and are things that you can do in your organization as well. So I'm excited to help you think like a grant reviewer as a way to strengthen your grant proposals. So what we're going to cover today are the different ways that you can grab your reviewers' attention, get them excited so that they want to advocate for your proposal. We'll talk about what it is within an application can be compelling to your reviewers, regardless of their background or experience level with your specific types of programs or services. We'll think about why grant makers advocate for specific applications, and then I'll walk you through a specific process you can do with each and every one of your applications called Mock Review. We'll begin, as I said, by talking about how it is that we grab our reviewers' attention. And so that means we need to pull up the entire grant life cycle in order to have this conversation. What you see on this screen right now starts with just like at a clock, at the 12 o'clock position, readiness. Now, grant readiness means that we're thinking about an organization's eligibility and also their ability to be competitive based on the type of organization that they are. If you find yourself applying for an uh, a opportunity, a grant application, and your organization isn't eligible or isn't the desired organization type, there are going to be a fair number of questions from the reviewers and you might not ever even be formally considered. They might not ever even get to the meat of the application because their attention was caught by some of the more logistical things. So we don't like to see that happen. We want to see you spend your time ensuring that you're applying for opportunities that you are eligible for and truly could be competitive for. That's where we start when we think about reviewers' attention. But next, we're going to move around the circle in a clockwise direction, and it takes us to research. What we research about a grant maker, whether we're talking about their IRS forms or whether their website, their list of recently funded organizations, those are all things that help us understand who it is that we're applying to and what it is that we might want to say or do in our outreach to help us be as competitive as possible. Really, that's doing our homework so that we make a great impression. We'll continue then around the circle, continuing in that clockwise direction so that what we use, what we learn in research, to develop great relationships whenever possible with a grant maker. Well, we're doing all this and we haven't even gotten to writing. You're right. That's exactly it. There's a lot of pre-work that has to be done in order to ensure that our written work is going to grab our reviewers' attention. Those first three items in the life cycle could influence how our reviewers react to our organization. We'll use what we learn in order to inform our writing and customize our writing in the most competitive way possible. And then because we've done it all so well and we positively grabbed our reviewers' attention, let's assume that you'll get the grant award and it will be time to, of course, first of all, celebrate, but then move on to reporting before we get to start the whole life cycle over again. Let's drill into what this really means a little bit deeper. When we're in that research portion of the grant life cycle image that I had on the screen a moment ago, there are a number of details we're trying to learn about each and every grant maker. I have the seven things that I and my team are always looking for about each and every grant maker, whether we're talking about foundation or government. 
These seven items help us to decide, should we dig deeper into this grant maker or not? Are the grants that they're making too big or too small? Do they fund in my state or my region or not? Do they even want to receive my proposal without first the funder reaching out to extend an invitation? These are all important things that help us decide who might we move onto our grant calendar, who might be a part of our grant strategy. But I'd like to draw your attention to number six and seven on this list, communication preference and capacity, as well as social media. When we are doing our research work, not only are we trying to decide details related to the size of the grants, the amount of the grants, where the grants will be, we're also trying to learn where and how is the grant maker available to us to build relationships, if at all. There are certainly plenty of grant makers that have no capacity or preference for communication with you or similar organizations before they receive your inquiry, before they receive your request. So we need to find out if there's any information indicating where and how they might be willing to communicate with us, because that helps us move around that life cycle image from research into relationships. Because if we're thinking about grabbing our reviewers' attention, indeed, the first impressions that we make, those are so important. Whether it's an email or a phone call or meeting someone at a conference or a collaborative meeting, or maybe a, a warm introduction at a special event in our community, those interactions are indeed first impressions that may play into next steps with a particular grant maker. Now, are they always possible? Of course not. I just mentioned that not all grant makers have the capacity or the preference to communicate with an organization pre-award. But if a grant maker has any capacity or any preference that would allow you to talk with them, to email with them, to have some form of communication before you apply, you want to be prepared. You don't want to let that opportunity and that interaction go to waste. So what I'd encourage you to do is to develop talking points so that should you have the opportunity to send that email, to make that phone call, to have the conversation in person, that you are ready. And the good news is that these talking points, they're going to work in any of these settings. Certainly. A little bit of adaptation would be necessary if we're writing them versus saying them. But when we find a funder we're interested in, this is our next step to ensure that we are prioritizing, reaching out, building relationships, and maybe even sharing these talking points with our executive director or a board member or a, a programmatic senior leader who may be the one to encounter the grant maker out and about if it's not going to be us. So here's what I recommend you include in these talking points. The first thing to include is who are you and what agency or organization are you with? And if you're going to be speaking to a grant maker that's outside of your immediate community or region, let's be sure to let them know geographically, where are we? Let's give them a little bit of context. I always need to say when folks ask, where am I based? I don't simply say upstate New York. That's too broad, too vast. I say I'm based in upstate New York in the Thousand Islands. Actually, that's far, far, far upstate New York, along the Canadian border at the end of Lake Ontario. I want to make sure that I see some form of recognition that they understand exactly how far upstate New York I'm talking about if it's an individual or an organization that really doesn't know New York geography. Okay, but so we make that brief introduction and then we get prepared with point number two. Based on what we researched, why do we think that this grant maker is a great fit for us? Why do we think we would be an amazing partner for them? How could our work, our programs and services help the grant maker achieve their goals, their mission? This is something that should be like a sound bite. It should be something that you could deliver in 30 seconds if you were in an elevator with the grant maker. Okay, maybe up to a minute, but it should be succinct and to the point. It should be based on the research that you did, based on their grantee list, based on their website, 
based on their social media stories that they share, things that you can cite in the conversation. So that it sounds something like, Dear Grantmaker, based on what I saw on your website in your Grantmaker priorities and what I saw in terms of your recent grantee profiles, I think that we would be a fantastic fit because, and then fill in the blank. After you've shared why you think you're a strong fit, it's time to pause. This is your first impression with the grant maker. Let's see how they feel. Have you grabbed their attention? Do they think that indeed you might be a good fit? So ask, leave a pause, ask for their feedback. What do they think? It certainly won't be a guarantee one way or the other, but if they're interested, if they indicate that indeed, hmm, that could be a fit with our guidelines, you want to be prepared with some thoughtful questions, again, based on what you researched about their guidelines, their process, their timeline, you want to have up to three that might help you customize your writing work so that it's as competitive as possible. If you have found a grant maker that is so clear in their guidelines that you have no questions about their process or their timeline, then I would encourage you to ask a question that gets the grant maker to share a success story, something that they're really excited and proud about for the impact that their grant funding has created in the community. That gives you a sense of the types of stories they like to tell and therefore the types of stories that they might like to hear. So while the point of talking points is to learn, might we really be competitive or not? Are there any questions I can get answered? It does also serve as an opportunity for you to learn some nuances that could help in the way you tell and sell your story in the application. Now, grant maker relationships, they're a big deal. They are a huge part of the grant life cycle. So I want to make sure that you know, after watching today's session, you are welcome to download our free Grantmaker Relationship Toolkit. You can either use the bit.ly or the QR code in order to access that free download. That'll help you. It's got the talking points that I uh, mentioned and a few other supporting forms, uh, templates, and suggestions to help you with your Grantmaker Relationship Outreach. But let's go down that negative path. How do we grab our reviewers' attention in a positive way early on in our grant life cycle if there is no capacity or preference from the grant maker to have any communication before we apply? Yep, it's going to happen. In fact, it's going to happen a fair amount. So how are we grabbing our reviewers' attention? There was no opportunity for a good first impression via email or phone or in person. Rather, our first impression, it's the moment that a reviewer opens the document. That's it. And so how can we make them smile? How can we make a good first impression? Well, it does depend on every grant maker, on every organization that we might apply to. But here are some pretty generally well-accepted reasons that a reviewer will smile. Uh, any reviewer I have met, or actually now I'm talking about myself too when I was a grant maker and still when I serve as a reviewer, but any grant maker I've ever talked to, they enjoy narratives that get to the point, that directly answer the question and do so without trying to use up all the available space or all the available words and characters. That is always going to get you a gold star. Reviewers are also very excited when they read objectives that are written in smart format. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. What happens when you provide smart objectives? It's not a guarantee, but you help answer a lot of questions that a reviewer or a grant maker would have about your program, your project, your services. So writing in smart objectives, start writing your objectives in smart format is really you're doing your reviewer a favor because you don't want your reviewer left with unanswered questions. You don't want them putting a question mark on their hard copy of the document or typing a question mark in the margin of the PDF or circling a section. Nope, we don't want to do that. If our reviewers have unanswered questions or maybe even concerns because of their unanswered questions, 
that's going to make it difficult for them to advocate for us to get funding compared to another proposal that's being considered at the same time. And then this last point, maybe this is one of those forehead slap moments. Maybe this is where you say, duh, but we want to follow the grant maker's requirements. I need to say it. I have been a reviewer plenty of times where a well-intentioned organization did something that was not following the grant maker's requirements. If they tell you it has to be mailed in hard copy and to not staple, then uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go to the post office, a little old school, I get it, but we still see these requirements sometimes, and we're going to submit it by the timeline provided. If the grant maker tells us that all attachments need to be one PDF packet and the narrative as a second attachment, separate PDF attachment, well, that's exactly what we're going to do. As small as those details may seem, any time we do not follow the requirements laid out by the grant maker, it very well may feel like you are disrespecting their process, and that is certainly not a good first impression to make. What we really want them to focus on is what we've written, all the hard work that has gone into the application itself. We want them to be engaged in what we're proposing, not in the details surrounding the application itself. That's why we focus on making a great first impression so that when the reviewer opens the PDF, or prints out the application, or opens the mail, that regardless of what they've asked for, whether it's a really rigorous full proposal with everything from executive summary through descriptions and capacity, budgets and attachments, or air quotes here, simply a two-page narrative with your 501c3 letter, whatever it is, we want to ensure that the reviewers are engaged in our story that it's consistent in all of the elements that they read, that they're engaged and not left scratching their head wondering about some of the details. So what we have to think about first is that the application, it includes everything that we're submitting to them. That is the biggest story that we're going to present. And when we think about what makes that application compelling, we want to ensure that what we say, what we write, is customized to the grant maker and their why. Your organization has a why itself. It's usually indicated as part of your mission statement. What is it that you are trying to achieve? Why do you exist as an organization? Well, the grant maker has one too. And how are those dots connected? How is your why connected to their why? And how do you tell that story throughout your application? There's no way that a boilerplate will help you do that for each and every application. This is something that has to be customized each time you open an application. So as we consider what your story is for Grantmaker A and what your story is for Grantmaker B, and C and D, maybe all the way to L, M, N, O, and P. <laughs> However many grant makers we're looking at in one year, they're each going to have a slightly different reason that they're excited and engaged in our work. And so we have to start by thinking about where we customize and include that messaging within our application. That way, once we have a framework for our story in place that of course, you're right, follows the grant maker's requirements, their structure, their character limit, their word limit, then it's time to ask ourselves, okay, with what we have available to us, how can we present our organization, our program design, our amazing outputs and outcomes, our impact we're creating, how can we convey all that in the simplest manner possible? Not because we're trying to dumb it down for our reviewers. Absolutely not. But rather, who you are, what you do, it's really complex. And for a reviewer, a grant maker, who's learning about your work for the very first time, we want to make it as easy for the reviewer to digest as possible so that we're not making assumptions about their knowledge or about their understanding of our program design. 
yet it's very clear for them what we plan to do and what we anticipate accomplishing. So one way that we can do that is by including visuals. When formatting allows, including a visualization can be a huge win. Here we've got two different bar graphs looking at student data and it's comparative data. So we're looking at two different periods of time as well. Just imagine how long the narrative would be to support this sort of visualization versus a little bit of context in the narrative with reference to the image and then sharing said image. Maybe you don't need to share both bar graphs. Maybe you're not focused on reading in this proposal. Maybe it's only math. So you share half of this image, not all of it. The point is you are taking very complex data and making it easier for your reviewers to digest. Does it always need to be so complex what you're trying to simplify? No. Even basic demographic information can be what we're focused on helping our reviewers to digest. The breakdown of the ethnicity of those that we'll serve. The age group breakdown of those that we anticipate serving. We might use a very basic table if formatting allows. We might insert a pie chart. We've got lots of options, especially if we feel comfortable or dangerously knowledgeable in Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. But we also have some options. Perhaps we want something a little more visual. A tool like Canva, which is free for nonprofits, can be a great way to create a, a singularly focused image that could support your text. Now, of course, these suggestions related to visuals in proposals, they are assuming that this is something the grantmaker allows. Some online portals do allow for an image to be pasted. Others do not. And sometimes when you're dealing with uh, the document that you're creating, the space limitations, it's a trade-off, and there might not be room for a visual. You've got to stick to text. I get it. But if formatting allows, if space allows, I would encourage you to consider how you could use some form of visualization to make your complex work easier for a reviewer to digest. But let's look at a different way that we might visualize our work, different than a bar graph, a pie chart, a basic table in a, a narrative section. You may have the opportunity to provide a logic model as part of your application. In fact, the grant maker may require it. We've seen that happen in everything from small community united ways up through absolutely lots of federal grants and then everything in between. So when we look at a logic model, this is a visual way we're making our complex work available to our reviewers. But logic models don't always feel comfortable. So I want you to think about how we design our programs, how we convey our program design, and remember that a logic model, we're at a 30,000 foot overview. We also have another opportunity to convey our program design information, and that's in the form of a work plan. So taking the key activities that were called out in a logic model, and now providing some of the detail about who and when the different activities will happen. So that is still a wonderful opportunity to take a lot of very complex program design information and program implementation information and make it easier for reviewers to digest. Don't discount the weight of what these documents can convey and how important they are for reviewers in understanding the work it is that you plan to do with their funding. If a grant maker offers you a template, this is a very specific example. This is from a federal funder. This is from Health and Human Services, but this looks pretty complex, doesn't it? Don't let the template scare you. It's actually rather basic, and the grant maker has done a significant favor for the applicants in some ways by making it easy to help the reviewer understand what a year looks like. By typing in the activity, description in the second column of this table and then indicating in the timeline columns which months from September through August 
which months in the school year would this activity take place? You could mark it with an X, with an arrow, with dashes, with an arrow at the end if it's ongoing for the whole uh, balance of the school year. You've got some options that visually make it pretty easy for the reviewers to see what does the school year look like in terms of where in the year these activities will take place. So step back and think about the template that the grant makers provided and how you can use this form to help tell your story. That will also give you the opportunity when a grant maker asks for a work plan or they ask you about key activities and perhaps doesn't provide a template, maybe you'll have a new favorite template that you've learned to rely on that helps you tell your story that you might insert into an application if formatting allows. Well, we've been talking about narrative and how we might use visuals in a narrative to help our reviewers understand our information, and then how we might convey program design information through a logic model or a work plan. But it isn't only about what we write. It isn't only about the narrative portion of the application. Frankly, a huge part of how a reviewer reacts to your application is going to be about the budget information that they may request. So we need to consider what does the story convey when it comes to our budget form. When we look at the way that grant budgets are approached, there's a lot of variation, not only from grant makers in terms of their requirements and their forms, but also in terms of how nonprofit organizations or charitable organizations may be approaching the grant budget process. What I would encourage you to consider are these three steps. First, know what the cost, the total cost of your program or project is. Does it cost $100,000? Does it cost $105,000? Does it cost $92,000? Doesn't matter. I, nope, I'm fine with whatever the answer is. I want that to be the factual answer that your finance team agrees is the total cost of that project or program. Second, I want to understand how did you get to those numbers? What are the formulas that were done or what percent of the personnel or what is your fringe benefit rate or how many miles at which mileage reimbursement rate are contributing to that travel cost? Whatever the details are, make sure you understand how each of those numbers were reached. Not all grant makers want to see it, but you need to be able to back up the numbers you're providing. Now you have such strong information available, you're ready for the third step. Now you can customize your internal information and put it into the grant maker's budget form. That, whew, that'll feel easy peasy versus trying to create a new budget each and every time you open a grant maker budget form. That is not competitive and that's very stressful for both you and the team in finance. So instead, think about what internal budget form will you use to document the total cost of a project or program before you start to document what amount are you going to request of that project or program budget from the grant maker. So in this example, that first homework item I mentioned, total cost of a project or program, you'd be documenting it in the far right hand column. And then, because you're ready to customize for this grant maker, you could think about, well, of the total budget, where do I put each of the request amounts? Hmm, do I wanna ask for all salary support or some supplies or some postage? Of the expenses that we've already agreed on as a team are part of this project or program, which line items am I going to ask for the funding from? And because we've already developed our project or program budget, we would know if we had any committed or any restricted funds that were going to support that project or program in the upcoming year. We might know we have a state grant or we have a multi-year gift from a major donor or we have $5,000 from the community foundation. Whatever the details are, if we already knew our total cost of the project or program, we'd also between finance and the fundraising development team be able to know what do we have for that committed revenue so that we can think about 
well, if this is what's committed, how much is left for us to secure? What is pending? What can we show as the total picture about our budget to the grant maker? This helps them understand how diversified our funding is, if we're sustainable, what other sort of resources are supporting the project or program they're being asked to consider. This is a really big deal for many grant makers. They want to understand who else is supporting the work, who else may support the work, and what type of expenses are they supporting. So don't leave the grant maker budget form for last. Now, if we think about the application as a whole, our idea, our goal in putting this application together is always to customize it for each and every grant maker so that we basically knock their socks off. We want each of our grant makers to be on the edge of their seats to think about how they're going to advocate for us in the process. And so I want you to think about if you've ever had the opportunity to step in to a reviewer's shoes, if you've ever had the chance to serve as a reviewer for a United Way or a community foundation, or to sit on a, a panel for a state agency and consider applications, or if you've ever even thought about applying to be a reviewer at the federal level. This experience is one of the best things that you can do for yourself in terms of professional development to put yourself in the shoes of the grant maker and see what it feels like when you read proposals with fresh eyes and have to make judgment on how did the proposal do? Did it clearly describe the project or program or not? So side homework, in addition to learning in today's session, if you've not had the opportunity to serve as a reviewer, I'd suggest putting that in your professional development plans for the upcoming year. Well, here are some of the things that you might learn. If you've never been a reviewer, here's some of the things you might expect. Or if you've served as a reviewer, these are some things you might have seen firsthand. There's a significant amount of variation that can happen when it comes to the process a grant maker uses when reviewing applications and making decisions. But regardless of that variation, Reviewers get excited and are willing to speak up on your behalf when they catch your enthusiasm, when they're excited about what you're proposing, when they believe that indeed your organization has the capacity to do what you say you will, when you say you will, and how you say you will. They get excited when they see that indeed, wow, this could really make a difference in this community, or wow, they're going to be able to double our money because they've got matching funds available through their community foundation or through a private donor. Whatever the case might be, if there's some way to leverage their funds, that is an extra feather in your cap that's going to get the reviewers excited and potentially have them advocate for you. So a quick story, a real story, one that comes to you from one of my review experiences. Now this was an opportunity where the funding was focused on a specific geographic community. And the reviewers were from a wide range of backgrounds and their shared experience and expertise was about the community, not about a particular type of service or program. The group was uh, made up of an engineer and an, a banking executive and a land trust staff person and a social worker. And, oh, well, of course, yours truly, the grant professional hanging out in the room. All of us had very different perspectives. Some, like me, love looking at the grant budget first. Others, especially the social worker, wanted to look at those outputs and the objectives. What are we thinking in terms of anticipated outcomes? We all brought something very different to that room. Well, what happens? when a reviewer advocates for you. In a room like that, it means that they're willing to speak up, to not sit there and let the review discussion happen around them. Now this could go both positively or negatively. So it could be that a reviewer is advocating for an organization not to get funding because something that they read left them with so many questions that they're actually advocating for the organization to not be funded. 
But that's the other type of advocating that, well, we don't want that kind. We want the positive kind. We want you to get reviewers to advocate for you because they are excited because the work was presented clearly, concisely. Perhaps you used visuals if formatting allowed to make your complex information easier for them to digest. So we don't want our reviewers to feel blasé about what they're reading. We want them to be engaged and excited so that they are willing to speak up on the conference call, to speak up in that conference room, to say, you know, I, even if partial funding, I believe that this group is it's going to create some great impact. I believe that they should receive some funding or even better yet, I think they should get all of the funding that they requested. A grant reviewer needs to be compelled to speak up. Sitting and passively letting the review pass process happen around them is a risk that you want to avoid. So one of the things that we can do is try to empower our reviewers so that they're excited, they're armed with information, and while there's no perfect thing to say that will do that, there are a few things that we can avoid to hopefully prevent them from sitting quietly in the review process or maybe even speaking up negatively. We only want to encourage them to say positive things. So here's some things we can hopefully avoid in our application that will help empower the reviewer. So we want to avoid phrases like, we are not sure how we will continue the program after your grant funding ends. Now this one might make you wonder, but Diane, if we knew how to fund this program indefinitely forever, well, we wouldn't be asking for grants in the first place. So how do we handle this? The reason that this statement can get you in trouble with a grant reviewer, with a grant maker, is that it is not looking far enough forward. It is not talking about the long-term strategy and planning that your organization is doing either to make a program, maybe not fully self-sustaining, but partially self-sustaining, or it's not looking at how you can build multi-year funding relationships or how you can diversify the funding or that, oh, geez, are you really, do you have a longer term strategy for fundraising, whether it's grants or development, or are you going year to year to put things together? Really, the way to address this instead is to talk about your plans for fundraising, not the we intend to seek other grants and talk to other major donors type of response, but detailed specifics about how it is that you create your strategy for fundraising and grant seeking and how that then becomes a grant calendar for implementation and some of the detail about the relationships you have that might be part of that future funding plan. The second thing that I'd encourage you to avoid to consider the rephrasing of is we hope to be able to. It sounds nice on the surface, but it doesn't sound very confident, does it? And if you're not confident as the applicant about what the impact is that you are working towards, that you believe you will create, well then why should the grant maker be confident and excited? It's a This one's a pretty subliminal piece where it's gonna be about how the reviewer feels as they read this. They might not come right out and say, I'm not sure I believe in their ability to do this. But by couching your responses in what you hope to be able to do versus what you will do can really have an impact in how the reviewer feels as they finish reading your application. So be more active, be more confident in your language. Grant makers know it's not a guarantee about output and outcomes. It's your best laid plan. So be confident in your planning abilities and your program design abilities, and let's leave the hope at home. Our next item that I would suggest you avoid, we need your funding to continue to operate. Now, this sounds a little bit like number one, doesn't it? And there's a lot of truth to this. Dear Grantmaker, we need your funding to continue operating the organization. Yep, 
I got it. I get you. I feel it. But what does the grant maker really care about? They really care about those you're serving. They really care about the impact you're creating. They really care about the change that you're having related to climate change. They really care about the change you're trying to have in your educational system for your state. Fill in the blank with whatever your mission is. That's what they care about, not about you as an organization continuing to operate. It is not about keeping the doors on and the lights open. It is about the impact you are trying to create. The doors and the lights, they are a means to the end. So yes, you need their funding, but it's not to continue operating. Even if you're gonna be asking for general operating support, nope, you're not asking them to continue to support your operations. It's so that you continue to focus on, you continue to achieve the impact that your mission statement calls out. This next one, sometimes there's a little bit of pushback. So maybe you'll have some questions here for me after you finish this recording, but be careful of buzzwords, of things like, we are so unique without giving the specificity behind what makes you so unique. Be careful about saying that you are innovative. Everybody's innovative on some level. Tell the grant maker why what you're doing is so different. Don't just rely on some of those very broad buzzwords and phrases that we think grant makers want to hear. They're sort of skeptical about those. It's actually the last bullet on the screen that probably will make you go, what, really? Acronyms, please avoid them. Please do everything you can not to put them in your proposals. I get it, character and word limits will often force your hand. Occasionally, there's literally no way to write the sentence and meet the character limit of the sentence without an acronym, but those are rare. Acronyms, as a rule, frustrate reviewers. They don't want to have to reference an acronym cheat sheet. They don't want to have to flip back to the top question. They don't want to have to flip back to page two, where you first defined said acronym. They don't want to have to do that. They're trying to read your work and understand the work you're proposing. Oh, wait, hold on. I said you want to think about how to convey your complex information in as simple a way as possible. Yeah, don't use acronyms. <laughs> That's a basic answer. So even if a grant maker doesn't allow for images or visuals, avoiding acronyms is actually achieving that original goal that I gave you. Make your complex work easy for a reviewer to digest. I once worked with a reviewer on a federal panel that got so frustrated by acronyms and proposals that they said if they were starting one of the proposals they were assigned and they saw a bunch of acronyms, they just set it down and came to it last. So I'll just get to you later. Well, now the reviewer's been reviewing for a long period of time and they might be somewhat tired and they're gonna put their best effort forward, but still, I'd rather not frustrate the reviewer. Not a good first impression. So I'll get off the soapbox, but whenever possible, avoid using acronyms. And our last of the five items to avoid, when you think about the outcome statements that you're making in your proposal, let's think back to our SMART objectives. Are they attainable? Are they relevant? We're thinking about what relates back to the goal. And we're also thinking about what's attainable, achievable, given the program design we have, given the budget that we have. Those are some of the factors that our reviewers are taking into consideration. So if we think about what an overly ambitious outcome statement might sound like, I would like for you to just pause for a brief second. Think about how many zeros the grant budget would have to have in order to say in any town, any town at all, that you will eliminate childhood hunger in that town. How many zeros? Yeah, lots. Okay, good, we're in agreement. 
So unless you're writing like a billion dollar proposal to a huge international foundation or a huge US based foundation, probably not the outcome statement that you're going to make. Could you reduce childhood hunger in a specific town as a result of what you're proposing to do for something less than all the zeros? Yes, I, I believe you can. But that's a very big difference in saying reduce versus eliminate and what is going to feel attainable, the achievable related to your objectives. So please think about how much your request amount is, how much your total project or program budget is that you're showing the reviewer, and what is it that you're saying you're going to achieve? That's what the A, the achievable, the attainable, that's what that's really driving at. We don't want our reviewers to say, do they really understand how hard this is? I don't think they do. Now they're questioning your capacity. If they're questioning your capacity and expertise as an organization, odds are low that they're going to speak up and advocate for you in a positive way. So those are five things that I've seen in proposals over the years that if you can avoid those issues and instead focus on the really great positive things we talked about, making your applications easy for reviewers to digest, making sure that your budget tells a great story, using visuals when possible. Those are the sort of things that will make a reviewer smile and get excited when they're reviewing your work. Now that brings us to our last section, creating a mock review. What is a mock review? Well, it's a process that your organization can use so that you do everything in your power to avoid this particular line in an email or in a hard copy letter. Dear so-and-so, we thank you so much for your application seeking our support. While we appreciated the opportunity to learn about your work and we wish you well, there were more strong proposals than there were dollars available in this funding round. We wish you the best of success. Sincerely, Awesome Grantmaker. That letter is awful. That email is awful. No one wants to receive it. I used to write that letter when I was a program officer for a foundation. They're usually true. Even when there's a proposal where the reviewers didn't advocate for them, there's still, there's good work being done. And there probably was something about the proposal that was fundable, but it definitely was not competitive in the process itself. So we wanna be the standout. We wanna be the absolute yes, which is where these goldfish on the screen come in. The goldfish in the bowl on the left, they're fundable goldfish wonderful fish in their own right could make a wonderful pet. But if you were trying to scoop them out with a net, hard to say which one you're going to catch. Some might go home, others might not. We could say some get funded, some get partial funded, some do not. But that goldfish that is literally leaping to the bowl on the right, that goldfish is super competitive. That goldfish made sure that their budget told the story, that fish made sure that their complex information was easy to digest. That fish, they're going to be the first one tacked up on the whiteboard in the conference room or the first one listed in the Google sheet for who's getting funded and who's getting fully funded. We want that. So what we usually do trying to think about how to make our application better is ask for feedback from our colleagues. Ask for our team to provide feedback. And what often happens then is that we get feedback that's something like, oh, looks great. Hey, oh, fingers crossed, I hope we get it. Oh, you, um, I think you missed a comma. Or, oh, there was, this one was a little confusing for me, just right here, but I, I think it was just that you missed one word. So they read it and they're trying to cheer you on and they're excited and they're proud. And they feel like maybe even the, the tiny bit of copy editing is improving the proposal which technically it is. But copy editing, an important part of our grant seeking process, is not enough. Because copy editing, even when following, like the, let's say you're using APA as your style guide. So you have your proposal copy edited. Following the APA style guide, is that enough? 
No, because it still is really about the opinion of the editor and their understanding of APA and how well your proposal did. And perfect grammar is never going to be why you get the grant. Mock review, this extra step you're going to start to do, this is based on the opinion of the decision makers, of your reviewers. And it's based on the idea that your grant makers, while they appreciate strong grammar, what is it that they're looking for? What is important to them as they read your proposal? What will make them speak up and advocate for you? So a mock review helps us to think, how will the reviewers judge us? How will they score us? If we're being scored, often that happens in government proposals, sometimes even with foundation proposals. If we're being scored, great, we get it. It's a numbers game. We want to get tens, solid tens, across the board tens. But even if they're not scoring us formally, we're still being judged by the reviewers. So they might not have to throw up a 10 card like they're a judge in the Olympics, but uh, we want them to be really excited and feel the 10 so that they are willing to verbally advocate for us in the process. So a mock review is taking the grant maker's guidelines and turning it into a final review for someone in your team to provide feedback. So like in this example, if this is what you are applying to, you can see that the grant maker is going to score you. There's going to be one point assigned for need and two for target population and seven for program design. We can tell we will be scored for the way we are judged and therefore ranked against the other proposals. So our mock review is going to help us, well, create a fake, a mock review. How do we think we will score? Here's another example. This is an online application, character counted, oh joy. Scoring tips are in the right hand side. While we don't see the points next to the question itself and the guidance, what we learn is how will we be scored? How will the reviewers judge us and our application? So what we do is we read through the guidelines for the clues about how we will be scored or judged and create a quick one sheet to allow a colleague or ideally a few colleagues to judge and score our work. What we're trying to do is have ideally three colleagues who did not help write the proposal to review and judge or score the work so that we can see how we might do if we were to click submit or put it in the mail or hit send on the email right now. And so we're gonna do this and give those reviewers a few days in order to take some time with the proposal. It's not that we're asking for a lot of time, but we want to be respectful of their schedule. And we're asking for somewhere between 30 and probably 90 minutes, maybe if it's a really big government application, but like 30 minutes even just for a foundation proposal. So when we get back our homemade scoring sheet based on what we learned in the guidelines, we take the average of the scores that were provided so that we can see if there's a section that needs some work where we might lose some points or where the reviewers mm, might have some questions. And so we can prioritize, what do we have time left to edit? What do we have additional information about that could strengthen the response? Now we've got a plan to make it even stronger before we click submit. Okay, but this process, there's some important things to highlight. This takes some psychological safety for all involved. For the lead writer to be judged by their peers, yikes, that can feel scary. For those providing the feedback, also can feel scary. They might not feel comfortable providing their honest opinion about score or how they're judging the response. They need some coaching, some direction to know that they should provide the tough love to help the organization get the grant money. It doesn't mean that the writer is a poor writer, that they did a bad job, but it means that there's something about their response that is not directly answering the question or is not going to help the grant maker want to say yes. And the organization will be better off. Everyone involved will be better off if we directly answer that question. 
But as I said, this definitely takes some time to set up for people to feel comfortable with this idea. One other very important thing to know about mock review, it means that you have to be ready to submit early. If you want to do this process, you want to have everything done. Like done, done. Could click submit, but are choosing to do mock review to strengthen the work before we click submit. The reason we want everything to be done before we do this mock review idea is that if we send something that's still sort of rough, still in draft, still with a comment or two or 10 in the margin, we now have all sorts of ways that we can rationalize the score or the judgment that we received. And while it was helpful, it wasn't as helpful as it could have been. Now, if you have colleagues who are concerned that you might hurt the lead writer's feeling, or they're worried about the tighter timeline, or they say, oh, our editing process is fine. As a team, you're right, we need to agree that this is a good idea because this isn't something only a grant writer or grant professional can do. You need others to be involved for this process to even be possible. But unless you're receiving all of the grants that you apply for, I think this process, it might be worth considering. Anything that can help us increase our success percentage, like this, I'd say is a win. Oh, but well, still, let's remember that there are plenty of other factors outside of our control. How strong are the other applications? What kind of relationships do the grant makers and other applicants have? Were there priority or bonus points that those other applicants could receive that we could not? Those are things that even mock review can't address. But mock review will ensure we put forward the strongest proposal possible before all those other external factors are considered. So we will know and sit easy, sleep easy, rest easy, knowing that we've done everything in our power as a team to put forward the most competitive application we can. Now, whether you decide to dig in on the review process or not and try mock review, let's remember this as well. The reviewers are spending time and effort to review and judge your work. And so if they have provided any feedback, we would like to know what it is so we can improve based on their feedback. So if we're denied, let's find out why so we can potentially avoid doing that again. If we're funded, oh my gosh, that's amazing. We still want to find out what our score was or what our feedback was so that we can do it again. So whether you get the grant or not, asking for feedback, asking for your scores, asking for the reviewer comments should become a habit that your team engages in. Now to help you feel a little more comfortable about this idea, because you're right, each grant maker different process, different guidelines, different scores. The good news is this, you can have many different ways that your mock review will look from one grant to the next. Different tables, different format, that's fine. It should be aligned with what the grant maker provides, whatever is easiest for you to create and yet still easy and simple for your colleagues to complete. And in fact, we even have a generic format when it is clear as mud, also known as not clear <laughs> how the grant maker will review or score your work. We've got you covered. We've got a generic template that you can use if your team is really engaged in and embraced the mock review process. So you'll want to use the bit.ly or the QR so that you can download the mock review toolkit as well. Free download, happy for you to have it and make it your own if the mock review process is indeed something your team is willing to do so that you can knock those reviewers socks off. Now we have covered a lot of information today about how it is that you can engage your reviewers, how you can think like a reviewer, and why and how that's going to help ultimately strengthen your grant application. If you have a question, please reach out. I am happy to answer. My email is diane at dhleonardconsulting.com. 
reach out, ask away with those questions. Let me know what happens when you do the mock review process or what questions your colleagues have. I'm here and happy to help. I want to thank you for joining us for how to think like a reviewer. And again, many thanks to the Adirondack Rural Health Network for providing this training and making it available to you.